Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today, we are talking about the 2017 film, The Disaster Artist, directed by James Franco, screenplay by Scott Neustadter and Michael H. Weber, based on the book, The Disaster Artist, My Life Inside the Room, the greatest bad movie ever made by Greg Zestero and Tom Bissell. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Aran. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayetos. Hi. So we wanted to do something fun since tis the season of April Fools. <laughs> and so we thought it'd be a good experience, a journey to go on to dive into the room in lots of different ways. So we're talking about The Disaster Artist, the movie about the room. And then over on Patreon, we decided to do an audio commentary track, basically a live watch along where we watched the room together as a team and had some surprisingly insightful uh, conversations. <laughs> it's giving us a lot of credit. <laughs> we tried. We would weirdly just like talk about film for five minutes before being like, oh, wait, we're watching The Room. Let's get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to do analysis as much as one can while watching The Room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was a lot of fun. I feel like we learned things. We, we went on a, a whole journey. So that commentary is waiting for everyone over on the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. Check it out. And so, yeah, today we're going to talk about The Disaster Artist. Before we dive in, question for Spotify listeners, people listening with the Spotify app is, what's your favorite line from The Room? Like, if you have to choose one, <laughs> Godspeed. Let us know what it is. I want to read them all and relive it. Okay, so The Disaster Artist. Trisha, you have read the book. Yes. Tell us about the book and your experience with it, and then kind of how that shaped your expectations for this crazy movie. Sure. So I became a fan of The Room, the movie, in 2008. And at that time, it was still kind of like, not the massive sort of phenomenon that it eventually, you know, became. And so when we heard there was a book coming out, me and all of my friends, like, freaked out and just got so excited about reading the book because of course and we'll get into it but like the mystique of the room is like what happened <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, when the book was coming out i pre-ordered it and then i realized that i was going to be in north carolina at a wedding when it was going to arrive at my house and i was like no 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 so i went and i quickly changed the delivery address so it would be delivered to the place that i was staying in north carolina and then after the wedding, I took the train home from North Carolina. I took the Amtrak wow. from, I know, which takes 79 uh, hours. Okay, I was going to ask. <laughs> okay, many hours. So I took the Amtrak home, which I really, really recommend doing. I won't go on my Amtrak selling <laughs> pitch here and why it's amazing to see the country by Amtrak, but it is. I read The Disaster Artist, alternated. I read like The Disaster Artist as well as a a pornographic novel I can't talk about. <laughs> that is, it's quite the train ride. <laughs> it was the best train ride ever. <laughs> it was just such a wonderful reading experience. Like, I was just watching the most beautiful scenery go by, and I was reading two of the greatest books I've ever read <laughs> in my life. Wow. And it was, it was an incredible trip home. So I've loved The Disaster Artist, the book ever since then. I had like, I was jealously guarding my copy. All my friends wanted to borrow it. And I was like, you can sign it out. I, you're not <laughs> like, or order your own copy. Like a <laughs> library. <laughs> Check it out. From Seriously. The library yes. of Trisha. Yeah. And, uh, but I did at some point make a critical mistake because I think somewhere in 2015 or 16, someone took my copy and they haven't given it back. So <gasps> if you have my copy of The Disaster <laughs> Artist. <laughs> if you're listening and you have Trisha's copy. <laughs> I'm angry. But yeah. So then, of course, we were unbelievably pumped when we heard that they were making a movie of it. Um, and we went like on opening day to go see the disaster artist, the movie in the theater. And it was also an incredible experience for those that are fans of the room. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm deeply immersed. There can't be enough room content as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Trish is our resident room super fan. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know we had sure. <laughs> yes. on the team. Right? <laughs> okay. And so how do you feel about, you know, the movie in relation to the book? Is it like a close adaptation? Like, what are we missing not having read the book? It's a fairly faithful adaptation. I have a lot of thoughts about, like, where it differs. Because 
as with any adaptation, the film version just ends up having to condense a lot of stuff and focus a lot of stuff that I kind of miss when I watch the movie. Mm. Like the film is almost too hyper focused on the relationship between Greg and Tommy, which of course the book is written from Greg's perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm ultimately not sure. It like kind of makes it a little too tidy. I think of like a buddy movie. Mm -hmm. Then the kind of chaotic experience you you get from reading the book, which holds a lot of other things about the production and, and about all that stuff. And so I really like the movie. I, again, as like a room fan, I'm super here for it. It leaves me wishing, like, I would just recommend go read the book. Like, if you really right. like this movie, like, pick the book up as a companion piece. It doesn't have to be on a train. But, like, read the book <laughs> because it will add so much more to your experience, I think, of both watching The Room and watching The Disaster Artist. Cool. Yeah. And that's something I definitely want to talk about is how much, as you're saying, the movie is like, couched, rooted in this friendship and makes it about this friendship mm-hmm. story. Cool. OK, so we can talk about that. So basically, like what Lord of the Rings is to Brian and Alex, The Room is <laughs> to Trisha, is what I'm discovering right. here. Wow. All right. Like, she's going to redirect the book pre-order <laughs> to the wedding location. That will be right. my legacy. <laughs> yes. Put, put it on my epitaph. OK, and so to just quickly finish going around and, and to get people's reactions. So, Brian, when did you see The Room? When did you see The Disaster Artist? What were your expectations around this movie and this movie about this movie? Yeah, we talked about our experience with The Room on on the commentary, so I'll, I'll leave that there and you can go listen to that. With The Disaster Artist, I was sort of fascinated by the fact this movie was existing. I'm not the biggest fan of James Franco as an actor or a director, but like kind of how appropriate for him to play uh-huh. and direct a movie about the room. I remember the first trailer was literally just the him doing the the famous Ohio Mark scene over and over again. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's sort of like a two things happening in this movie, one of which is look how well everything is redone you know like actors will lift up their hand at the same time they do it in the movie and and that kind of thing so you see the the side-by-side comparisons over like the closing credits i think but then also these actors don't really look or act that much like their counterparts Mm -hmm. so i end up struggling where i'm like how do you read this movie do you read it as it's the apatow camp you know it's the francos and seth rogan and that crew and even a lot of the like the smaller characters are from you know those movies the the knocked ups and the 40 year old virgins and the i love you man and all that kind of stuff where it's like if you read it as that kind of movie you're like oh i'm on a fun like silly adventure with some some idiots you know we're just gonna have fun and and like whatever but if you read it as this movie had Oscar buzz around it. And it's like, you know, right. like that kind of thing. Then it starts to be, well, okay, but it's not great. I would be fascinated to see the version of this movie that has like, quote unquote, real actors trying to like, absolutely nail the performances. You know, you get like right. a Michael Fassbender to play Tommy or something like that, or like Mark Damon from, you know, Talented Ripley Man or something like someone. <laughs> Mark Damon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like you find someone who can just give the like Gary Oldman as Churchill version of this performance where you're like, holy crap, I cannot believe like they actually nailed it. Instead, you get some perfectly fine actors doing either like in Greg's case, just like Dave Franco's playing a Dave Franco character basically, or in James Franco's case, he's playing like a very caricature, but passable version of Tommy Wiseau, which is fine for what this movie is. But there's definitely part of me that's like, I really want to see the like real, real version of this movie and not the kind of fun apatow version of this movie. Yeah. There's a little bit of an inside jokiness to right. watching this. Right. That, that's kind of how it feels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. I feel like Michael and I have a lot of thoughts just like reading <laughs> our body language right yeah. now in response to what we're hearing. Alex, do you want to start us off? <laughs> we may be yeah, on the same page here. It's so interesting to hear you say that, Brian, because I think what I love about this movie is I expected an Apatow jokey jokey, like this is going to be all tongue in cheek, all wink wink, all silly. And I actually think the way it's directed and the way it's put together and the like genuine heart that is attempted in like the relationships in the movie is different than kind of a knocked up or 40 year old virgin tone to me at least. Mm -hmm. And I think 
what I love about this movie is I am constantly laughing, not because the movie is kind of in this wacky alternate universe that's like a silly universe. It does feel like the movie is taking place in our universe. And these are just actual people that have existed in our universe. And that's insane. And and, and like, mm-hmm. and it's almost just presenting the insane reality of that. Like, like Tommy mm-hmm. Wiseau, I think, is impossible. Like, like you see of him course. in mm-hmm. the room and he's already an impossible being like i don't know what that is like (laughs) so so i guess like you know james franco's performance like i i remember seeing the teaser for the movie where he does like just do that line over and over again and i wasn't that impressed i was kind of like oh he doesn't look quite right his face is too skinny and Mm -hmm. you know he's just kind of doing the tommy Wiseau accent like whatever but there's something about the totality of his performance or the body language and just the way he interacts with people in the movie that is more than just to me, it's, it's more than just an impersonation. There's something else. There's a third dimension there. And because of that, yeah, I feel like this movie transcends what I expected because I thought it was going to be one big joke, all caricature. Like, this is a weird person. Look how weird he is. And I think it is that. Like, is look, look how weird he is. But also, the stakes are high. The stakes are high for him and Greg. Mm-hmm. And the stakes are real. And there's real emotion and real things on the line. Uh, so... So for me, it's it's like this really amazing accomplishment to make a movie that has this much like reality around an unreal event. Right. Hmm. To clarify, I'm not saying I think a more sort of hard hitting raw version of this movie would be better. I'm just saying I would be fascinated to see it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I'm kind of, yeah, on, on the same page with you, Alex, where I think I, you know, when I heard they were making a, a movie about the room, I was not excited. I was like, that's a terrible idea. I don't want to see people just make fun of a thing for two hours or try to spend a bunch of time just recreating, like, why why recreate a thing that we already have that you can just go and watch the movie? So I, I didn't understand what they were going to be going for with it. And so, and maybe this is partially, some of it also was an expectations mm. right, situation where I expected it to be terrible. I'm, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of like James Franco when I heard it was him and he was going to be playing Tommy Wiseau. I was definitely not excited or mm. expecting a whole lot. But like you're saying, Alex, I think the movie tries so hard to go for a, a three-dimensional portrayal of them that it's so rooted in this friendship and that it's a Hollywood story. Like they yes. managed to make it a universal, like somehow make you empathize and, and understand this, this, the struggle one, like the promise of Hollywood that is sold to everyone that draws everybody here through Tommy and Greg's eyes. You see how brutal that world is so there's a lot of commentary happening also and you know you have judd apatow right like playing the asshole like producer yeah and yeah, yeah it's about so much more than just the room and look at how goofy this guy is and so i right. think that's for me what elevates it and makes it really entertaining i absolutely agree that this movie is very entertaining and i think that one of the places where it succeeds is that you don't have to be and probably shouldn't be a room mega fan to sit down and watch this movie and enjoy it. Sure. They made a movie that is accessible to everyone. Now, ideally you've seen the room one or two times and might even be like a legitimate fan of the room, right? I have no idea how this movie reads. If you've never seen the room, Mm -hmm. someone tweet at me. I have questions. (laughs) Let us know on Twitter. We (laughs) Very curious. <laughs> if you saw this movie first and then went back and watched The Room, I yeah, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Is it trying to posture itself as a documentary? It isn't trying to be super right. insidery where you need to know, like, you don't have to have read the book. You know, it's probably better if you have it. They made a movie for general audiences about two friends in Hollywood that, as you said, Michael, is universal and relatable. It's a story about friendship. It's a story about dreams. You know, they made a very accessible, entertaining film. That's what I think they were trying to do. And so I think that even though there is this sort of inside jokiness tone to it in seeing all the actors that you like know from other things Mm -hmm. playing these different characters, you know, it essentially is a comedy. It's a very lighthearted comedy that is enjoyable to watch. And I think that's what they were trying to make. 
And so, you know, I miss, there's a lot that like, I feel like this movie just doesn't capture about the room and doesn't capture about Hollywood and a lot of the fascination of what makes the room like such a fixation for me. This movie is not a complete picture of that by any stretch, but I don't think that's what they were trying to make. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I I absolutely agree that it's, this is the movie they were trying to make, which is sort of, it's almost a hybrid of we're actually going to do a real movie, but we're also going to do like an us movie, (laughs) like the kind of movie you expect from us. You know, I think it does a good job of walking that line. Mm -hmm. Maybe what what Mike and I are responding to is like the real movie label. Sure. Because to me, it's more of a real movie than I expected is maybe Mm -hmm. the the expectations game of like, I mm-hmm. was expecting a cheap movie. I was expecting oh, it to okay. be, we can lean on the room. We can lean on the weirdness of Tommy Wiseau. We don't have to do this actually well plotted out like character arc of this like buddy comedy story. Like I didn't expect any of that. I thought it was going to be just look at these crazy people. Look how weird they are. Everybody is just weird and bad. And instead, there was a movie with a lot of heart in it. And yeah, the, the taps into that Hollywood dream mythos in mm-hmm. a way that I was not really even prepared for. So that's, yeah, I th- think there's a lot of expectations going into this movie where I was expecting cheap, like cashing in on the room. And instead, I got a, a quote unquote real movie out of it. Mm-hmm. It reminded me a little bit of The Social Network also uh, upon rewatch and that it's it's a movie I could see that that's about you know ostensibly real things that happened but to make it a compelling story it needs to be rooted in more primal stuff mm-hmm. so it's mm-hmm. a it's a story of a friendship that you know was dissolved in the case of The Social Network or that you know triumphs I guess at the end <laughs> of the disaster yeah. artist and just that, that that's was an interesting choice and I think is smart to do what we're talking about of like making it generally accessible. And it also has this kind of interesting structural thing where, you know, you necessarily are going to have to spend time with Tommy and who he is and what he's doing. But the movie, especially in the first act, grounds you with Greg as protagonist. And so it's kind of one of these weird things where Greg is the protagonist, but Tommy has so much of the screen time and is taking so much of the action. And I think that's maybe where uh, it as if we're trying to talk about it, you know, in isolation as a perfect example of structure, I feel like maybe that's where it bumps and then does rely more on look at how insane Tommy's actions are in this Mm -hmm. scene or that Mm -hmm. scene. And so I do think especially in the middle and act two, it, it kind of feels like it maybe forgets a little bit the protagonist and who it's supposed to be following in service of more Tommy craziness. Cause now we're in like the making of the room. And so it, there right. are like the obligatory scenes. <laughs> <laughs> there. Yeah. This is exactly what I was going to say, actually, Michael, which is it does essentially follow like a great Gatsby <laughs> model. Mm-hmm. Is this our generation? The great Gatsby? Maybe. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> where you have a <laughs> Michael's <laughs> sorry Michael it feels, it feels right for our times you know this is our great Gatsby <laughs> oh, yes man yeah yeah where you have a character you know that is enigmatic uh as the central character uh but where we have an outsider's POV that is the protagonist that like sort of wants to be a part of his world and, and whatever access and what, yeah. what he has. It's the great Gatsby. <laughs> oh my God. And, you know, I think that it makes the handoff in the middle, as you're pointing out, to we sort of, we do lose track of Greg for a little while. Um, now, it, it does end up circling back to him at the crisis, right? Which is, right. he has an opportunity to play this part on Malcolm in the middle, uh, <laughs> but Tommy won't let him keep his beard for an extra day <laughs> All right. what a crisis it is All right. um That's and so essentially great. like give up on his dream right they they do a pretty good job of like narrowing those stakes into mm-hmm. the relationship where it's like i'm coming to you as a friend asking you for this thing which i read is you know was invented for the film like that wasn't mm-hmm. how it happened in real life right um, but, but but what a good screenwriting choice to give this fork in the road for greg and have him choose the you know, right. what most of us would think is the wrong path. <laughs> right. And his girlfriend did break up with him in real life. And then they they kind of kept that, although they did it off screen in the movie. But so, yeah, there mm. there is real screenwriting here. And it does make the handoff in the middle. I just think that 
ultimately you end up having to, I think this movie has a much slower first act and first half of the second act. And so it ends up feeling a little disjointed after the handoff where it's like, is this a making of comedy or is this, you know, focused mostly on this friendship? Because then we end up in scenes where, yeah, Tommy approaches the producer at the restaurant that Greg is nowhere to be seen, you know, right. in, and then mm. like lots of scenes where they're on the set and Greg is just kind of there, but not, you know, driving the plot at that point in any way. So, yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, if you are going to make a character like Tommy Wiseau a main character in your movie, you have to have a different protagonist. Now, obviously, course, the right. real book is written from Greg's point of view. So it's, it makes sense to do that. But if this was just the Tommy Wiseau story, you know, <laughs> we don't know enough about him to make that story, you know, like, <laughs> well, but but even if you just wrote like even if you just took this character and wrote a, you know, half fictional right. version of him really trying to make something and do this like it's just it's a little too insane. It's not grounded, you know, and Greg sort of becomes the the audience character. You know, we're Definitely. looking at all this through his lens and there's a sort of endearing on. He's 50% what the hell is going on here and 50% I have a dream and I want like maybe this guy can help me, you know, fulfill it and he's a friend and and that kind of thing. So you sort of are are torn as an audience just as he is. And I think that, yeah, we do stray from Greg a little in the second act, but also we've kind of at least earned the ability to by that Mm -hmm. point because we're like, okay, now we know Tommy is sort of our arm's length character. So we can follow him for a little bit without ever feeling like we are supposed to really truly be completely on his side. We are still just sort of like watching him from a distance because Mm -hmm. we know we're going to eventually come back to our real person on the ground watching (laughs) watching this this thing happen. Yeah, the movie does a good job of capturing that feeling that we've all had of having a difficult friend Mm. where you end up becoming friends with someone and you can't remember why, right? It's been like (laughs) so (laughs) long or like maybe you knew them from childhood, right? right? Maybe like you were just in a situation, you were coworkers in a situation together, whatever it was. You bonded over something, even though you don't have a lot in common with that person. And they they turn out to be an incredibly difficult person. But then, you know, it's four years down the line or however long, much longer in some cases. And the movie puts you in that headspace by putting you in with Greg. So Mm -hmm. by the second half of the movie, I agree, Brian, we are also Tommy's friend. (laughs) Right. And we also feel the like awkwardness of having to be Tommy's friend when he's being insane. (laughs) We're like, we've come this far. (laughs) Right. That's how it feels. (laughs) Yeah. They set up the friendship both like in, you know, almost like a a favor transaction. Like Tommy uses that as, you know, ammo against Greg at some point. Look at all the things that I did for you. And Mm -hmm. now you're going to betray me. (laughs) Toxic. (laughs) It also sets up Greg to be, you know, in his idealism and his hoping and wishing for like, we're going to be different. I feel like part of that is, you know, I also want to be a good person. I want to be a good friend. So you are in that place of like, well, at what point is my friend's weird behavior too much? Like at some point, I want to fight for my friend and stand up for them. And and we see how mean everybody else is to Tommy, too. Mm -hmm. So even though we know how crazy he is, the, the meanness that everybody has and how they throw that at him does make us want someone to kind of stand up for him some of the time and that that gets us far enough to then you know once he's making the movie we understand just how much he's bought into it and so we understand why he thinks he can't stop but you need to stop and there's the the great scene where they're trying to shoot the first sex scene and just everything is like that's one of the most stressful scenes (laughs) put to film yeah because it has all these elements where you you empathize with everybody and in a unique way and it, the tension there is just so it's awful uh-huh the other thing because it's all around the midpoint is that that meltdown on set and and that that follows another really great scene in like the mexican restaurant when right greg mm-hmm. and his girlfriend are announcing which shouldn't be like a big announcement <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I think what's so honest about this film is that it gets at these weird relationships, you know, like mm. where everybody knows like there's no reason why it should be a big deal for you to move out of Tommy's apartment, but we know it's going to be. And we know right. he's probably not going to react well because <laughs> he's Tommy and there's some weird 
something's going on here, you know, that we don't even understand. And so it's it's a wonderful, truthful, honest scene that we've all kind of experienced in one way and another in our lives of just like, this is a normal thing people do, but you're going to be really upset about it. And so we're going to like buy you dinner and try to make it go over well. And go to a public place. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And then you cut to Tommy outside ripping the newspapers out of the <laughs> right. newspaper stand. I love how he's just, we have that wide shot and he's like, I hurt, I hurt my foot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good moment. Um, absolutely with all of this, I think that the character of Tommy to present him on screen in a film like this is a bit of a screenwriting feat, right? Because, yeah. you know, in the case of something like Gatsby, you have like glamour tied up with it and like aspiration right (laughs) and there is something appealing about tommy's fearlessness and lack of embarrassment in the first half of this movie right that again the movie does a really good job because we're so in greg's pov and we see how scared greg is and he's like you know hung up as an actor and tommy's so uninhibited that greg almost is like Maybe, yeah, maybe he knows something I don't know about acting, right? Or he can he can help me like free myself from um, my inhibitions. It is Gatsby in the sense that Tommy is very much a, an outsider to society. Whereas, you know, everyone in Gatsby thinks that Gatsby is great. Right. Unlike in The Disaster Artist, where everyone around Tommy does not understand him and is not interested in trying to understand him. Right. Mm-hmm. So you have to have this undercurrent of like, no matter how outrageous Tommy gets, he has to inspire empathy and like, I don't want to say pity exactly, but that is in there. Yeah. Right. Where, Mm -hmm. and that's a big part of the book, especially. So the book focuses a little more on the period of time when Tommy was writing the disaster artist. Mm he and Greg weren't really speaking during that time. It was like a nine month period. Tommy had kind of disappeared and Greg hadn't seen him. And then when they like met up again, which the movie has this scene in it, Tommy's like, here, I wrote it. And you know, in the movie just has a montage of like Tommy writing the room or whatever. Right. (laughs) That's one of the parts where I was like, I wish I could see more of what this process was like, because that's surely fascinating also. Mm -hmm. But it's a total mystery. It's like a black box. Yeah. Yeah. Also, maybe Johnny is vampire. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> which was a discarded plot of the uh, room. There was supposed to be a shot where it's revealed that he is a vampire. Yeah. Anyway, but in the book, they really do focus on Greg reading the room, the script, and realizing that Tommy had used the script to kind of exercise his own demons of loneliness and depression. And that is the reason Greg was like, I will help you make this pretty much because. Mm this is cathartic for you and it might save your life, right? He was very seriously worried about Tommy's mental health. The movie The Room ends in a tragedy. You know, the character of Johnny Mm -hmm. takes his own life Yeah, Yeah, at the end of the movie. And Greg saw that very much as a metaphor of like, Tommy was in the darkest place possible when he wrote this. And so making it as a piece of, you know, constructive piece of art and then setting out to actually make it himself no matter what it cost six million dollars <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of like gatsby in that way where it's like he has a fortune <laughs> he's, you don't a serious amount of money <laughs> right, right where's the money coming from there's a lot of parallels yeah but yeah I, I think that you have to have the equal parts pity and also like mystery where tommy is very unsympathetic for a lot of the making of the room portion of this movie where he's just being a tyrant and mm-hmm. everything. and But the foundation of we feel sorry for him has to be there. I think it also helps that they use other Hollywood examples as, well, when this person did it, it was okay. So like Tommy sure. is you know, aspirationally looking at James Dean mm-hmm. and like that sort of, um, you know, the rebellious attitude and just the, the, like the pure art and all that stuff. And mm-hmm talks about Hitchcock and Hitchcock was a jerk on the birds and actually (laughs) terrified his actors. Like, does anyone call Hitchcock a bad director or whatever? And don't do that, everybody, as we've talked about. Don't (laughs) Don't abuse people on your movie set. You don't have to psychologically abuse people to get good performances. No, no. (laughs) And so it's, it's almost like Tommy is like the most extreme, obvious example of why that is a false equivalency. But yes. you get 
why he could think that because lots of people think that and we do kind of celebrate that sometimes as a film culture or definitely right. have tolerated it in right. the in film history or, yeah. or or even just have a fascination around it mm-hmm. yeah. you know right it's part of the intrigue the whole movie does a great job of capturing the aspiring actor director like image of hollywood and what a hollywood thing is and how much of like their goals in this movie are just to be the Hollywood thing. Like even when uh, Greg in the opening, that brilliant opening scene (laughs) where Greg is like blown away by Tommy's like virtuoso performance Uh in his, it it gets at this weird cultural idea that like, what is great acting? And, you know, in this kind of one dimensional way, Greg interprets great acting as this is like over the top, Ness, like mm-hmm. Im- almost embarrassing fearlessness, like that equals good. And that means he has something special. Or at least that he understands that that is a critical element of good acting. Right, that he right. Is completely lacking. Right, like, right. I sure, think that scene right. really, really sets that dichotomy up why you understand why he would even go and approach this guy. Right. Mm-hmm. But even beyond that, I think when, when they're looking at performances or when they're talking about performance, like they do seem to equate big and extra dramatic and loud and over the top like emotion like equals great acting because it's the Mm -hmm. most visible type of acting and then there's also the directorial examples from tommy are hey we can shoot in this alley back here that looks exactly the same as the set inside (laughs) but this is a big hollywood movie we are shooting on a set you know we're not going to shoot in some location right so so much about what they were doing and aiming for is not even about like the product itself it's about living the hollywood thing as they see it mm-hmm. yeah it's it's funny it gives me flashbacks to to acting classes and stuff where you know you would do these like silly we're going to jump around the room and pretend we're animals or whatever just like and it's some exercise just to like sort of loosen you up and stuff and you would inevitably get the guy who thought he was too cool to be there who wouldn't do it and you're like you look like an idiot in this room full of people acting like elephants because sure. <laughs> you are like, oh, I wouldn't, uh, why would I do that? I'm just gonna, I'm not here to do that. But then you also have the person who like is using this to like exercise all their demons. and It's just like screaming to the heavens. You're like, oh, good God, you're like freaking me out too. It, and funnily <laughs> enough, it seems it's sort of like Greg and Tommy represent these two ends of the spectrum, right? Where Greg right. is like, I'm fascinated by people who are actually able to let themselves go and not be embarrassed and that kind of thing. And then Tommy is, as you were saying, it's this sort of sense of, oh, great acting is just being as big and as emotional uh, emotional as possible and that kind of thing and not about necessarily finding, working on Truth. that craft. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's so funny, again, using the James Dean example where they're watching Rebel Without a Cause, right? Mm-hmm. right? And it's like, you're tearing me apart is like the big you know right. thing that obviously makes it into the movie. That's an exceptional moment in that movie. Like his right. performance that <laughs> it's like the reason that is impactful is because That's a big outburst. That's all this built up stuff that's like emerging in Rebel Without a Cause. And so it's it's that thing. I think what you're identifying, Alex, here is this the visible parts of film are the things that if you don't spend time to actually think about and analyze why this thing is meaningful, you just try to copy the thing that you first identified and put that everywhere. Right. Yeah. I remember in our Sunset Boulevard episode, we were talking about sort of how complex the uh, the myth of Hollywood is, right? It's like an American myth, but it encapsulates a lot of things about like wealth and status, fame, all of these things. Uh, And Sunset Boulevard is a really good example of the performative aspects of the Hollywood myth, right? Where Hollywood is not interested in the truth that's kind of like built and rolled into the myth of hollywood that you can get on a bus from you know nowhere come to hollywood and you can be someone else because hollywood doesn't actually care who you actually are and that part of the myth goes back way you know to the beginnings of the studio system where they were just pulling people out of nowhere changing their names giving them makeovers turning them into stars because of the publicity machine and all of this stuff mm-hmm. This movie does a really good job, sort of in the way that Sunset Boulevard does, of focusing on the performative aspects, as you guys are pointing out. But especially in Tommy's character, where Tommy does not want to reveal the truth about himself. 
He <laughs> has secrets. He came from who knows where. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We don't know the truth about Tommy, how old he is, all of the stuff. So the the enigmatic part of that, I think, is a really poignant part of the Hollywood myth that ho- that Tommy has clung to, where he has decided, you know what, if I'm going to make it somewhere or build a new life for myself somewhere, this is where I belong. This sense of like, I fit in in Hollywood and anybody can make it here, right? Even if you're from New Orleans and, <laughs> <laughs> you're right, and you have no experience as a filmmaker. Hmm. And I think that that's something that has always fascinated us, but is super relatable at the heart of this, where, you know, we we see almost the hypocrisy from everyone around Tommy about wanting the truth and wanting it to be whatever. And Tommy's like, you guys are missing the point. Does it matter if it's real or not? Right. It should be this big thing. And I think that that's part of you know a really well observed part of the mystique of the room and Tommy and everything like this, where it's like, maybe he knows something we don't know. Right. right? Or like, <laughs> you know, he has gone back and claimed. And, and at the end of the movie, this movie, he makes the retroactive claim that this was supposed to be a comedy all along. Right. <laughs> that's, you know, kind of obviously false. But at the same <laughs> time, how do you argue with success? He's one of the most, you know, he's a famous filmmaker now. He's a legitimate (laughs) celebrity. He got exactly what he wanted out of the experience of making The Room. So was he wrong? Like, I don't know. He went to the Oscars. This is what I'm saying, which is just the most meta mind trip of all time. (laughs) Where it's like, who's to say, who is to say that Tommy's not a real filmmaker? He made a real film. He became a real actor. He is famous, like he's rich. He already was, you know, what, what is he lacking that he set out to get nothing? Okay. But let's also remember (laughs) one of the most famous actors of all time is John Wilkes Booth. (laughs) okay (laughs) just being famous and having done something doesn't mean she did it right. No, but I know what you mean. It's sort of like, it's just a weird, you can be successful even by sort of accidentally stumbling into the thing you weren't trying to do or getting recognition that maybe you didn't want. But I think what Tommy has done to his credit is accept the the narrative of the room. You know, it's crappy when you hear him say, oh, yeah, I was trying to make a comedy all along. And you're like, shut your face. Like, just, you know, you can own up to this and that right. kind of thing. But at the same time, he goes to screenings and he hears people laughing their asses off at this movie and that kind of thing. And and clearly he wants to. He he likes to be he he drives around with a car with the bumper sticker of the room on it, you know. So it's like he leaned into it. And I think that's that's the thing you can respect, I think, the most is is leaning into that rather than being just sort of so embarrassed you just disappear forever, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I do think it's a fascinating point, like you're saying, Trisha, that it's, you know, the end point where he ended up is exactly the same end point that, you know. Alfonso Cuaron or like any like esteemed director like kind of ends up and I feel like that's you know obviously the the quality of the product does matter and shouldn't be ignored but I think it's super revealing about Hollywood and then also just humans and the things that we celebrate and are drawn to and that ultimately his Tommy's story and the room and all of this is revealing something deep about the human experience right in a way that you know even the best movies like you know struggle to do sometimes and so it's i think that is the like you're saying the meta mind trip fascination (laughs) of all of this (laughs) well if you can think of sunset boulevard as being almost a cautionary tale about the cruelty of the hollywood system or the way that hollywood treats people like chews them up and spits them out right with norma desmond and joe gillis the two central characters from sunset boulevard one ends up dead the other one is you know incredibly delusional sorry spoilers for the end of sunset boulevard (laughs) you didn't say which one was which (laughs) fair 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 that movie is specifically about the cruelty of the myth of hollywood but i think the disaster artist is almost not, I don't think this movie is particularly interested in, in exploring what I'm talking about, but I think that every every piece of media surrounding the room is interested in almost the weird generosity of Hollywood that made space for this movie to like become the cult hit that it is. Right. And I think that that's our fascination with cult movies in general. It's like, 
why would we continue watching this movie, you know, over and over and over again? <laughs> Loves us, you know, we love to see an underdog triumph and that's part of it. And we love to help an underdog triumph, even if it's, I don't know, at their own expense, but but right. not in this case. Right? <laughs> right. Triumph, whatever that means in this context. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm thinking now about Sunset Boulevard. I'm going to say that the character of Johnny in the room is Joe Gillis in Sunset Boulevard, the disillusionment arc that mm-hmm. leads into mm-hmm. his death. But the character of Tommy Wiseau is Norma Desmond, Absolutely. which is... Oh, I love it. <laughs> which is... He gets his close up at the end. It's not yes. necessarily in the way he wanted, but he leans into it and you know that's that's where we fade out. Wow. So we got the Great Gatsby, we got <laughs> Sunset Boulevard. Like clearly this is amongst the greatest, you know, film literature of all time. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it is interesting that, you know, the the third act, the climax, how this film ends is, you know, the premiere of the room. This is where it does for me stop being a real movie, quote unquote, a little bit and starts to lean really into like, listen, we we had to do this because you're it's the premiere. And by the end of the premiere, it's gone from this is the worst movie ever to this is the first midnight screening. And within this one viewing, it became this thing. And I understand why they had to do that as a scene, as, you know, a structural thing. But that is where it it does kind of lose what veracity it had for me there. But it is cool that it it manages to get at what you're saying, Brian, of like the the idea that ultimately these people were able to lean into this strange fame and see the value, the joy that it brought people, perhaps <laughs> right. not intentionally, but right. that it was still this kind of product that has clearly shaped and changed people's lives and brought them endless entertainment. And that's what what else do you want from a movie? Right. You're talking about, Trisha, how Sense of Boulevard is that cautionary tale approach to Hollywood. and there is a really clear arc here of I mean, you go to that Judd Apatow scene and mm-hmm. he lays out essentially the, you know, what, what everybody realizes at a certain point in Hollywood, which is like, it's one in a million. And that's if you're good and you're not even good. And you know, the, <laughs> the, the harsh truth, especially if you're an actor of just right. like, good luck, buddy. Like you got to be amazing. And even then it's luck. Right. And there's that really like just defeating feeling of, Oh, this just seems impossible. This is an impossible mountain to climb. And movie ultimately is like heartwarming in this way of, you know what, screw it, go just make your own stuff, see what happens, you know, stop waiting for the system, the industry to accept you, do your own thing. And that's all you can really do ultimately is and in Tommy's case, who he is created this thing that somehow magically worked for thousands and millions of people, maybe, (laughs) you know, so I do like that. It's a inspiration story ultimately about don't wait, just do it. Yeah, but I do agree with you, Michael. I think it has the last scene at the movie theater at the premiere has a little bit of like a almost an inspirational sports film moment <laughs> right. to it. Totally, totally. Where it's like they're like just short of a slow clap, you know, kind of mm-hmm, thing right. that's <laughs> the trickle of the yeah. Almost happening. It 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 does ultimately, like I said, the movie neatens the narrative. Mm-hmm quite a bit and ultimately as i have lightly been complaining about doesn't dive super deeply into the things that fascinate me about the room and the things that i love about the room it's not trying to which is fine but yeah it has that sort of shininess of like we weren't friends the friendship breaks up at the crisis and then like we get in the limo together and then it's uh, then you know um greg talks to him and he's like listen you're bringing them so much joy just listen in there tommy Uh, and like they're all laughing and then everyone stands up like a standing ovation and he's like oh yeah you know it's it's like his equivalent of the oscars right where there's a veneer over that entire thing that is too shiny and neat i think Mm -hmm. yeah i read about the actual screening the actual screening was like very depressing like most people just walked out within the first like five minutes so it was nothing like the movie i cannot imagine like there are a few things that would be worse for me than having to be in that theater on the opening night right like when do we leave what do we do (laughs) yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not to say that Tommy doesn't receive standing ovations. Sure. When he goes to screenings of this right. now. It was, you know, the timeline was condensed. Yeah. Quite right. 
<laughs> the timeline of like five years was condensed to 90 minutes. Right. Yeah. As we've talked about, don't look to movies for accurate representations of events. But no. you get, you get <laughs> right. the gist. Yeah. You yeah. get the gist in the end. It is almost interesting what you were saying, Alex, too, about the aspirational aspect of the gatekeepers in Hollywood shutting down anyone that is not mm-hmm. doesn't have the the list of qualities that they require to be let in. And this being kind of an early tale of I'm not going to say democratization because you needed six million dollars. But yeah, right. Right. if you had resources, somebody else could make a story that could reach people. And I feel like now we're you know so deep into that age you know, thinking back when this movie was mm-hmm. made in 2000, it was, you know, if you want to make a movie, you got to go through the system and do all the things. And now we have YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and anyone can be famous. It's interesting to look at this as maybe like a forecast of the kinds of things that could happen and the, the people that would be able to make content and the surprising content that becomes popular that would never have become popular had it had to go through the conventional channels. I feel like we're like deep into that world now. So the types of people that become famous and why. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from the disaster artist? Alex, do you want to start us off? My big lesson is really what surprised me about the movie in the first place, as I mentioned earlier, which is so much of the comedy in this movie, there's so many of the moments that make me laugh really hard are not moments that are doing an overt joke. That, that are just playing it straight with like characters that are insane, like characters that exist in reality, but are inexplicable and being put into situations with other people who like live in our reality and are reacting to them and trying to deal with them. And that is so much funnier than a movie where everybody is kind of heightened and every, and the whole reality is kind of a joke. The best comedy that tickles me is putting like absurd characters or uncomfortable things into just straightforward uh, settings with people who expect other people to be normal and to do normal things. And the uncomfortableness and the awkwardness and the social cues that get all screwed up from this unusual element being entered into that stable reality is where the humor comes from. And so I, I really appreciate how many scenes in this movie play with that of just here's this thing, Tommy Wiseau, you know, we don't even know what to make of him. Let's just drop him into, you know, a casting call. Let's drop him into a restaurant. Let's drop him in here and (laughs) Mm -hmm. see normal people deal with him. And that is just so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And I feel like along the way, it reveals equally the absurdity of the situations. Of course. The absurdity of like our normal. I think that's what I always find fascinating. Right. And just, yeah, wh- how absurd casting calls are and like things right. that they're asked to do. And and then I think you mix that with, you know, a film set, like an environment where there are very clearly predefined roles and expectations <laughs> and everyone is supposed to just fit into their role and you're a cog in the machine and everything works smoothly as long as you're doing your job. And so everybody else knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And then there's this crazy wild card in the center of it. And it yeah it just shows the machinery and how it can fall apart and the right. fragility of it. And maybe why is it set up like this in the first place? Right. Right. Yeah. All those interesting questions. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Brian, what's your lesson? Uh, so yeah, along those lines, actually, um, and we've talked about it a bit, the sort of the lack of embarrassment of, of this character. And I was actually thinking about Rocky this time around, who I've always loved as a protagonist. And he's not really cool or smart. And what's mm-hmm. interesting about Rocky is that he knows it. Like he's he's very willing to admit, like, look, I'm not smart like you are or whatever, um, which makes him very endearing. But he's also just unabashedly emotional and unconcerned with with what people think Mm -hmm. one of my favorite character moments is just him playing with a dog in the the middle of the street and he's just so happy to be playing with the dog and you're like oh wait you mean the boxer from that boxing movie it's like no it's just it's just rocky he just wants to play with a dog you have a very different character in tommy wiseau in that he's not self-aware nor is he the protagonist in the way that we've talked about but he is naive and not uh, and sort of unembarrassed and not really concerned with being normal. And he may be rude or oblivious. He's usually not super abusive to anyone. Again, this is the character in the movie. But like, but when usually, he, usually, yeah. right. And when when he is, it's obviously a narrative thing. But also, it's coming from this place of insecurity. So right. it's almost like right. when he is at his yeah. most 
self-aware or most worried about uh, what people are thinking, that's when it turns into aggression and and sort of taking it out on others and that kind of thing. I was thinking in the way Rocky is an underdog in boxing, the meta of Rocky as a protagonist is that he is an underdog in the world of protagonists, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so you have your mm-hmm. James Bonds and your Jason Bournes and your Jack Bowers, all the JBs. <laughs> yes. But it's like, it's rare to get a character who's not meant to be cool. Even when it is Seth Rogen and knocked up or something, it's like the cool version of a loser, right? You want to <laughs> get a beer with them or you want to, uh, you know, have his sense of humor or something. So I just think it's cool to see characters who are compelling and sometimes endearing in their their uncoolness that you don't get this, especially in American films, right? The filmmaker mm-hmm. trying to be like, we got to make this guy cool and you want to be with him. You want to hang out with him and stuff. And and a character like Rocky Balboa or the character of Tommy Wiseau is sort of this, you don't want to be around them necessarily, or you don't want to be them. But the fact that they are sort of naive and uncool makes them makes them compelling. Yeah. Yeah. I like how you put that. The They're an underdog in the world of protagonists. Right. <laughs> and again, that, yeah. we love underdogs. That makes them easy to cheer for. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting observation. Trisha, what about you? Similarly, uh, my lesson is about Greg, which is... A difficult character to write here. And mm. I think that it, the character is really well written and really well played by Dave Franco. Like, obviously, you know, you have James Franco is over here chewing the scenery as Tommy. It's a very commendable performance, I think. So unfortunately for James Franco, I can tell that he's a real person <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, in a way that Tommy is not. Like, mm-hmm. so, <laughs> right. like, it's a very good performance, but you can see that the gears have turned to get him to where he is. Sure. As opposed to the sort of loose, uh, you know, canonness of, of who Tommy actually is. But I really, really think that the character of Greg here is so critical because we have to see enough like pushback from him when Tommy's like at his most sort of you know difficult and but we also have to like understand why Greg keeps going along with it and that has to be in the dialogue it has to be like in Greg's like physicality it has to be in the way that the scenes are structured so the one where they go to the roadside by you know the the where James Dean was killed is a really great example and it's a great scene early on and it is borrowed from the book I mean it is something that really happened Mm -hmm. but the spontaneity of it uh in the movie is is really well played where you know we see the pushback dynamic coming from Greg where he's like it's like three hours away man he's like no we'll go later we don't have to go tonight and you can see the that Tommy is chipping away at his inhibitions and and that he is liking the way that Tommy makes him feel, right? He's pushing Greg to be somebody new, to be somebody exciting to Greg that he like has been trying to find a way to be. And if you watch, you know, especially the first half, the way that the Greg character, he's not a blank slate. He has to be our POV. But he also has to be a real three-dimensional character. And I think that the, this is a really well-written part. And, and Dave Franco does a good job with it. Yeah, I agree. He's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so many ways that it could have gone wrong. And like you're saying, it, it does have, like, that character has to balance so many things in order for the rest of the movie to work. And it does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love the scenes, too. It's, it's just smart screenwriting where they have the parallel scenes where they're playing football, where... You know, (laughs) early on when they're playing football, actually just as friends, obviously Tommy doesn't know how to throw or catch a football (laughs) at all, but you can kind of see Greg just rolling with it and not choosing to judge, not choosing to make a big deal out of it is really lovely um, and endears us to both characters. Mm -hmm. But then having bringing that back at the end is another nice visual like, um, you know, bookend to here's where the friendship is gone now. And it becomes this really aggressive point of contention. So it's just screenwritery stuff, but this is a good screenplay and you can study it for that reason. Yeah. The character of Greg is really, really well written here. Yeah, absolutely. My lesson is kind of on that track. As I mentioned earlier, it reminded me of social network and just how when you have something tricky like this, Comparing it to the social network helps reveal to me the importance of grounding it in something that is instantly accessible and universal. And yeah, that the people can understand this is a story about 
to friends and the disillusion of their friendship or whether or not that's going to be tested. It, it's kind of like like we talked about in the Apocalypse Now uh, episode where it's slightly different, but you know, you have a, a very simple, clear goal mm. lets mm-hmm. you do these other things. As, as long as the audience understands like this is where we're going, this is how we're going to get there, created confidence around that, it lets you do these other things things trying to adapt a movie about facebook was a crazy idea and people were like why would anyone ever make a movie about facebook and so making it a movie about friends allows it to be a movie how do you make a movie about the room making it about friends allows it to be a movie and then kind of gives you the leeway to do these other crazy things so i think it's just an interesting comparison and and lesson to to see that in action Mm and the disaster artist yeah it's a smart approach yeah Mm -hmm. what have you guys been watching Trisha, what have you been watching recently? So I am two thirds of the way through a BBC series. I guess it's it's just a three part series that is an adaptation of Agatha Christie's Ordeal by Innocence. Hmm, I don't know that one. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with it either. I've read quite a number of Agatha Christie books, but hadn't read this one. So I was like, "Ooh, I actually don't know how it ends. And I yeah. still don't know how it ends because I've only <laughs> watched two thirds of it. So, But it's really great. It was made by the BBC in 2018 and has Bill Nye and Matthew Good in it. Oh, OK. Yeah. And it's, you know, a classic Agatha Christie mystery where it doesn't have any of the main like big, you know, her big detectives in it or anything like that. But everyone has a motive, definitely. And it's about this family or a couple rather that were childless. And so they started adopting like basically children and they adopted like six different children these children all grew up and it's a wealthy couple and whatever and then the mother is it's like halfway between a boarding school and like a family kind of thing and then the mother is the one who is murdered at the beginning of the thing and so like all of the children and members of the family and servants in the house kind of all have like a mixed relationship with her and like or conflicted relationship with her and who saw what and like what happened that night and I'm really enjoying it. The BBC has made a ton of these. Mm-hmm. They made like a bunch of Agatha Christie adaptations. Almost all of them are on Prime, I think, which is where I've been watching this. So I'm going to catch the third part of it probably right after this podcast and nice. figure out who did it because I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. I want to know too or deal by innocence all right that's a cool name too Mm -hmm. awesome brian what have you been watching uh well speaking of amazon prime i watched truth seekers which is the horror comedy series co-created by and starring simon Pegg and nick frost and nick frost stars as a broadband installer who's also a paranormal investigator uh so you know he starts (laughs) discovering things as he goes to a house to to install their internet malcolm mcdowell plays his father kelly mcdonald shows up uh, later in in the series and yeah if you're looking for just like a really fun smart funny sometimes scary british comedy i definitely strongly suggest you watch something else because this is not very good. (laughs) (laughs) It's like really tone confused. I'm like, am I supposed to be scared? Am I supposed to be laughing? Is this supposed to be serious? I'm not sure. I thought it was like an X-Files parody kind of deal. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely like a parody-ish, comedy-ish thing at its heart, but it just sort of there's sometimes where I'm like, oh, I really care about this character now and I really care about the backstory. And other times where I'm like, I don't what's happening. I'm not watching anymore. And other times where it's funny and kind of a goofy over the top way. And it's just sort of I watched the whole eight episode thing, but I just never quite got into it. OK, <laughs> I, I, so then I had to go and rewatch Spaced. The first Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost project. This has together. been a roller coaster already. It has, <laughs> yes. Because Spaced is awesome, uh, co created by and starring Jessica Stevenson. It's fun and weird and brilliant a, a lot of the time. It feels like a 20 year old low budget British <laughs> film. Uh, so there's a bit of adjustment you have to make there in terms of just like, oh, it's very like standard deaf, you know, but Edgar Wright's trying to do Edgar Wright things. And a lot of times it's like very, you're like, the camera's moving too much. What's going on? But if you're a fan of those guys and you haven't seen it, or even if you've seen it, and I'd recommend rewatching Space than watching Truth Seekers. Nice. So go watch Spaced. Okay. <laughs> the end. <laughs> wow. Excellent. Okay, great. Alex, what about you? Uh, so I watched the film The Mauritanian, which is available for rental on VOD right now. Ooh, nice. And this movie came up on our queue because my husband likes a very particular type of movie. Oh boy. His favorite types of movies usually have somebody like Jodie Foster in a pantsuit like being a boss. Okay. Like that's like, that's like, if he sees that in a trailer, he's like, we're watching that movie. I want to see that movie. <laughs> I dig. I think she's in a pantsuit in this movie, probably <laughs> uh, at some point. 
anyway, she's like she's like a you know a human rights lawyer taking up a legal case for a prisoner in Guantanamo Bay. And I saw the trailer and it great cast. It's got Jodie Foster, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, Shailene Woodley, and the actor who plays the prisoner in Guantanamo Bay, uh, Tahar Rahim, was really great. So I was like, it's going to be a you know a good standard whatever political thriller movie and kind of like hidden figures it was like it had that extra bit of above and beyond where you know mm. i went to hidden figures also thinking oh it's like one of these movies it's gonna be a very straightforward retelling of a historical story it'll be heartwarming yada yada there was an extra effort from the cast and crew in hidden figures to elevate it into just being a really great example of that genre of movie and i would say the same for the mauritanian like I, it definitely exceeded my expectations as far as just being very well done through and through great performances and like genuinely very engrossing the whole time. So if you're looking for like a, and it's a true story, like a true story, political kind of thriller, legal case thing, Mauritanian is great. Nice. Awesome. Okay, cool. Michael, what are you watching? So in the spirit of April Fool's Day, I'm going to do something a little weird, but you actually watched a movie. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's not a podcast or a video game uh no actually it's 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 uh, not a movie at all so there's a subreddit <clears throat> <laughs> called perfectly cut screams have any of you been to this subreddit no so the whole thing is uh it's it's video clips of whatever happening and the thing is that at the end of the video it always abruptly cuts out when somebody or something is screaming. And so it's often hilarious, like a like a prototypical one is, you know, a student recording teacher in a class, the teacher comes in, the teacher doesn't know that a student's hiding under the desk. So you see the teacher sit down and then presumably the hiding student grabs her leg and then she screams, like throws things in the air, screams, and then cuts before she can finish the scream. <laughs> and I've been thinking about this a lot okay. because I think it speaks to something about film language and Mm -hmm. psychology Mm -hmm. that I find fascinating. And probably I'm the only one that spent a lot of time thinking about the psychology of perfectly cut screams, (laughs) but also like meme culture in general, right? Any meme that has like four panels or even it's just the same image, but it's like each panel Mm -hmm. is like slightly zoomed in more. Like all of the stuff is kind of trading on film language and manipulating it in Mm -hmm. fascinating, interesting ways. And I so I've just found myself thinking a lot about the psychology of abrupt screams and why why are they funny? But sometimes they're not like certain situations are like required for a scream to be hilarious when cut off. And what's happening in our brains when when that's an imagination thing? Are we filling in the dots? Brian is Googling it right now. I can see he's like, I'm going to immediately start watching these. Well, it's so interesting because I've noticed this when I, I don't, I'm not on TikTok, but TikTok videos get reposted a lot onto mm-hmm. YouTube or Twitter or whatever. And I've noticed it's almost like a staple of the TikTok form to cut at, at just the right moment. And it's yeah. usually abrupt. It's It's got to be somewhat abrupt. And it's almost like if, if it's a, funny TikTok, it's like before you can start laughing, it cuts off and then you can start like, it, it's weird. It's like, but it works and it and it like, it's perfect. And I wouldn't mm. have it any other way. So. Our producer Vince just sent me a message just being like two plus two. It's, you know, mm-hmm. no country for old men, our video. It's the same important <laughs> lesson right. happening here. It's like suddenly it gets cut off and your brain has to fill in what happens. And that maybe, you know, makes it you make it funnier even because you're right. having to fill in some of that. Yeah. I mean, the role that editing plays in comedy is something I really don't understand, but I'm super curious about. Right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. There's an episode of Faulty Towers called Hotel Inspectors. He's waiting for these three people to show up and they're the hotel inspectors and they're going to give him a good review and everything. So three other people show up. He thinks they're the hotel inspectors. He spends the entire episode trying to impress them. <laughs> At the end, realizes they're not the hotel inspector. So he kicks them out. He's throwing things all over the place. Mm -hmm. As he's doing all this, three people walk into the lobby and he's like yelling at them and kicking them out. And then finally, he goes calmly up to the front desk and he says, oh, what can I do for you three gentlemen? Are you three, you know, fine folks or something like that? And then immediately realizes they're the real hotel inspectors and screams and it goes to credits. And it's like, that's such a British thing to just like end at the worst possible moment rather than. (laughs) The sort of, I think, American right. sitcom would be like, we're, now we're going to see what happens next as a result. We never see what happens next. We just see him scream and then it goes to credits. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I thought that was kind of strangely fitting because the room, as we talked about on our patron watch along, there's a lot of meta film language things right. that mm-hmm. this is in conversation with. I wish we had got to gotten to talk more about the editing. We mostly right. watched it. We got into the writing and the performances quite a bit, but yeah. didn't didn't get to talk too much about the editing. But it's that's a whole a that's a whole layer part of yeah. it. I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, should we just do it once a year? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could talk about the room that much. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> this has been our conversation on The Disaster Artist. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, patrons, for supporting the show. We hope you enjoy our The Room watch along. It was an experience. I, it was fun, right? I had a great time. It was super fun. <laughs> it was extremely okay. fun. Are you <laughs> <Okay>. kidding? <laughs> right. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. It's one of the more fun experiences I've had of watching The Room, which is saying a lot. That is saying a lot. We mm-hmm. know how it's your Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you, everybody. Just keep repeating it. <laughs> Stop trying to make it a thing. <laughs> making it a thing. Thank you to our editor, Eric Schneider. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Tweet at us and say hi. Tweet at me. Tell me what you think about the psychology of perfectly cut screams. I want to know all the theories. <laughs> and we will see you in the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.